Hi, Jamal. Hello. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Good. So uh, I wanted to talk to you about this piece you have in the current issue of the American Prospect about demographics and the Democrats. And you take a sort of counterintuitive view, which is backed up by evidence, of course, uh, <laughs> that essentially that Democrats shouldn't be complacent about how the changing demographics of the United States will lead to a permanent democratic majority. Uh, you sort of explode the myth that Latino and other voters of color are going to uh, permanently be part of a democratic coalition. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's sort of, it's, the, the the piece really hinges on this idea that racial line aren't the racial lines that exist today aren't necessarily going to be the ones that exist fifty years from now, mm -hmm. um, and that we've seen this in American history before. That you know, southern southern and eastern Europeans um, in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century weren't not weren't necessarily non-white, but they weren't considered white either. Um, they right. were, sort of in this they were considered outsiders. Right. They were they were mm -hmm. outsiders, and there was a, the, the mainstream at the time was sort of um, whites of Anglo and Northern European descent. Um, but that changed. A variety of social th social factors changed. The the Second World War really brought lots of uh, these Europeans into the mainstream, um, and that by the middle of this by the middle of the twentieth century, by about this, the sixties, and then certainly in the seventies, these ethnic whites are for all intents and purposes white. And at this point now, there's, you know, no one really looks at an Italian or um, someone whose family is from Eastern Europe and says to themselves, oh, that person isn't white. Um, they still still may be designated as Italian or, you know, Russian or, or Polish, um, but they, they aren't, no one says white person, not white person. And so I think a similar thing might happen with Latinos, um, you know, you have Latinos, there's a lot of racial diversity within the, the category of Latino. Um, right. You have a lot of people, even right now, who are basically of European descent, um, but are coded as Latino. But you can imagine, um, you know, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, that those people like Italians or Southern Europe or Eastern Europeans will just simply be regarded as white and you know to an extent that's already true um i i always i talk about this with matt iglesias a lot and i like to use iglesias as a good example of this mm -hmm. iglesias um is of latino descent um but is considered white considers himself white um and you know the only time um, in his telling that his uh, latino heritage meant anything politically and this sort of gets to the next part of my argument um is when Republicans are, are demonizing Latino immigrants. Um, and I think that this, on one hand, racial lines may shift, they probably will, and you'll have probably a lot of Latinos who are essentially identified as white and uh, to most people. But it's also true that if you have a political party that is um, relentlessly hostile to a group, that group's political identity might be formed in opposition to that group. And so, um, you can also really easily imagine, uh, you know, after a decade or two decades of Republican hostility to immigrants, you have Latinos who, in their economic and social lives, are have different sort of racial group group affiliation. Some Latinos are a large a large portion might be seen as white. Some might be some um, lower income, a more darker skin might be seen as still on the outside. But all of them. Um, identify their interests as an opposition to conservatives as a result of things that happened in the past. And this is something we sort of, we already see with African Americans. It's not that there aren't conservative African Americans, believe right. me. Or that there aren't conservative Latinos. Right, right. Um, you know, believe me, speaking as a child of a, a conservative African American, they're out there. Um, but the Republican Party has been so hostile to the perceived interest of African Americans that right. the, the, their political identity is almost formed entirely in opposition to them. I did not know that about you, actually. Yeah, that no. Um, you're the child of a conservative. My uh, my dad's pretty conservative. My mom's yeah. like mostly apolitical. But. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting.
So, I mean, do you think that that, not to get too personal, but I'm just curious, I'm always curious about when people take, a, end up as adults taking political positions that are at odds with what they grew up around and what causes them to do that. I mean, was there a point in your life when you, was it a gradual process or was there a point in your life when you just kind of went, oh, dad, you're just completely wrong about that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was one of those odd kids who was like really into politics um, and should have formed, <laughs> uh, shockingly, uh, and should have formed. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, formed political beliefs a little early. And so I kind of always sort of recognized my dad's a conservative guy and like have always known that I just sort of agree with him on um, a lot of basic things. Um, it's not really. There, I don't, I don't, don't really ever recall a point consciously where I was like, "Oh wow, I really disagree with my dad." Like I uh -huh. just kind of, I disagree with my dad about a lot of things. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, 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 you know, as as an aside, I would say that you know, relative to my parents or, or my dad, my um, my disposition to the world is much, it's very similar. Um, but it took me, I, you know, my, my own experiences took me in a different direction than my dad's. I, I can imagine, you know, a world uh, where I ended up a conservative. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. Different circumstances. You might have, you might have turned out differently. Right. Well, um, so back to this, uh, back to, to, back to your article and those, the implications of it. I have felt for a number of years that there's been... A little bit of a, I don't, I don't want to call it complacency, it's not quite that extreme, but sort of a, an, a the notion that, well, look, of course, the, um, the because the Republicans are so hostile to uh, undocumented immigrants and, um, and generally sort of engaging in a lot of xenophobic rhetoric and or at least you know the more tea party leaning republicans which is now the majority of republicans so that democrats are a little complacent about well of course these people are going to be in our camp but you're saying that it really doesn't i mean does it matter I mean, if if you're right that these people are not even self-identifying as um as latino anymore 50 years from now um do all these categories that we fixate on in the election matter as much as just the way different voters are going to react to a certain vision of what america is or should be does that make sense yeah um no i, I think that's um i think that's right that um like, ultimately, I think that you'll have this, you'll have a lot of people who, you know, we would call Latino now, um, who, we may, who we may still call Latino then, we just don't consider them outsiders, um, who's vote, because of that, their voting patterns will essentially become more like the median voter. Mm -hmm. um, and so it won't be, there won't be this determinism on the basis of, of ethnic identification. Um, which you know is both uh, it's both a pitfall for I think liberals, um, as you said, a reason not to be complacent, a reason to to work to persuade people over the long term that like mm -hmm. your vision is the correct one, mm -hmm. um, and in that way yeah. it's an opportunity too. Like if you can mm -hmm. if you can persuade this group of people that um, you know, the the liberal vision of more activist government. Um, of more, uh, I, I mean, of more liberals don't like to say it because it's not politically a good idea, but of more open borders, of more accommodation to immigrants, um, we're on your side and you should be on ours too. Um, and well, how, how much longer do you think the Republicans can continue with this anti-immigrant position and still win elections? Because even, 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 and this is a complicated calculus, but even evangelicals, conservative evangelicals who are essentially on most things on the side of the Republican Party have staked out a position for immigration reform, 
Uh, some of them were complementary of President Obama's executive order last week, um, not or his decision last week not to de deport um, children who uh, came here. Well, immigrants who came here undocumented as children were brought here by their parents when they were young, when they were minors. Um, and, but it seems like because of the political uh, setup of all of this, that the, these evangelicals aren't going to vote for a Democrat anyway right. because of abortion and same-sex marriage, right? Right. So their pressure, the pressure is probably a too soft a word because they're not really applying any pressure on Republicans to actually do anything about immigration, right? So they come out with these statements and they have this new evangelical immigration table, which has been signed by a fairly big variety of, of evangelicals, um, white, Latino, conservative, more centrist. They're kind of all over the map, um, all over the evangelical map, that is. <laughs> um, but what what political impact does it have? I think that they're trying to say to the Republicans, hey, listen, like we'd really like to have uh, this growing population of Latinos in our in our religious camp. But if you keep alienating them, they're going to go to the Democrats. Right. Um, I mean, I think I actually think Republicans would probably play this game for a while. Um especially in a period of economic stagnation, right? Like you can sort of play this game for a while and then like, you know, if you end up being the the in party during the economic recovery, then whoa, everyone applauds you for your um, success in fixing the economy and you peel off, you know, and Republicans don't need to win a majority of Latino vote ever. They just need to be competitive. Right. Um, like get a plurality. Uh, they need to be... Republicans need to be with the Latino vote where Democrats are with the white vote. Like, not really ever going to win a majority, but if they can keep their numbers around 40%, they're in mm -hmm. pretty good shape. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I honestly think that the Republican Party can continue being really hostile to undocumented immigrants, to continue pushing these very terrible draconian bills, um, as long as sort of the broader political circumstance works in their favor. Um, I also think that, you know, I think that voters are surprisingly quick to um, forgive. Like if you have after, I guess at this point, right, like the five year mark since Bush tried to introduce comprehensive immigration reform. So let's say 10 years from now, um, you know, Republicans are finally beginning to change their tune. Um, George P. Bush and Marco Rubio our uh, president and vice president, um, which, as I say that out loud, is not as crazy a thought as it sounds. Um, it's actually shockingly likely. Um, you mean a Rubio George P. Bush ticket? Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, the president Rubio and vice president. Well, uh, I do Bush. know. I do know a lot of conservatives like the idea of Ted Cruz for president at some point. That's terrifying. But he, <laughs> <laughs> but he would have to win. He would have to win his Senate seat first. Right. If he can't win a Senate seat in Texas, there's no way there nominating him <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but no and so you have this future Republican Party that's that's becomes very friendly to Latinos you know there's there's really no other than the right now other than the fact that you have the Republican Party is really heavily based in the uh, it's really heavily older and heavily white um, and pretty older whites um, you know older whites are just tend to be more opposed to immigration than everyone else um, but as far as ideology is concerned there's no real disconnect between you know wanting tax cuts and being super pro business and also supporting uh, you know more lenient immigration law um, and so oh, but you know but you know so you look at uh, Romney's reaction to the Obama administration decision last week which was very Romney-esque in the sense that <laughs> You know, he really couldn't say any, you know, he, he, you know, during the primary, he had been against the DREAM Act because remember, Rick Perry was the candidate who said, well, you know, you don't have a heart if you right. are against Rick, Rick Perry the, the law we had in that. Texas that allowed undocumented immigrants, children of undocumented immigrants to have free, um, or to have in-state tuition 
right. at, at public universities, and well, we all remember you. So the reaction to that, uh, and so so Romney has to walk this line, but it's really kind of pathetic because he he seems incapable of actually taking a stand on it and saying what his position is. And meanwhile, he's campaigning in these swing states and going going to the Wawa and expressing amazement at the touchscreen ordering <laughs> system there. And, uh, <laughs> and, but clearly trying to reach the white working class voters that Obama supposedly has a problem with. Right. Uh, so, but can can Romney? I mean, can, is, do you think Romney's going to try to play both sides of this? So, on the one hand, you know, people are talking about Rubio as a possible running mate, or you know, um, and so on the one hand, he's trying to appeal to Latino voters, and the Republicans as a whole are trying to appeal to Latino voters, and then he's incapable of saying anything about taking a clear stand on. Obama's decision on these deportation orders, yeah, and I, and then he, you know, and he's clearly trying to make inroads with the voters, the white voters who supposedly have that are supposedly the problem demographic for Obama. Right. No, I don't. I, see, I don't think Romney has any real space to improve his position with Latinos. I do think, you know, like you described, he's pretty boxed in by the choices he's made. Um, he's kind of capitalized on disaffected working class whites and sort of bolster his position with older whites, he can't all of a sudden turn on the dime on immigration, which you know, the, the opposition to Bush's uh, comprehensive immigration bill came from those sources. So I don't I don't see Romney really changing position. But I do I do see a future Republican candidate uh, nominee uh, moving I, I, to the center, I guess, to, the, to a more sensible position on, um, on immigration. I, I think that you know, especially if Romney loses, right? Like if Romney loses mm -hmm. this election mm -hmm. um, and Obama wins because he just generated 2008 levels of turnout among Latinos and picks up and keeps Colorado, um, picks up Florida and what have you. If that happens, then I think the GOP, you know, despite despite its base, will just be like, listen, if you want to win elections, we have to win more Latino voters. Um, and we'll switch on a dime. Um, well, you know, that brings me back to the the evangelical question with all of this, because I think that the evangelical leadership is um, ahead of a big segment of the base on this issue, because I can't remember, I think it was Matt Staver gave a speech about immigration at the Values Voters Summit last year. And it just did not it just did not seem to resonate with the audience. And I do know that there are evangelicals out there. I don't think there are evangelicals who would bother to go to the Values Voters Summit who <laughs> do think that you know, so there's this this split, I think, among evangelicals. There are ones who are kind of more Tea Party oriented, and then there are others who kind of are looking to change some minds on some of these other issues. Absolutely, I mean, and I, the pro, I guess the the problem for the the latter group is that they do sort of work outside of the uh, of electoral politics, um, but they aren't, you know, like they aren't Republicans first and Evangelicals second. Not that the Tea Partiers are, but in terms of what they, their actions, that often seems to be the case. Um, but that, you know, they're less concerned with electing a Republican um, and so aren't necessarily involved in sort of the, the networks. Of, well, I think um, it's, it's also, it's, it's also an evangelizing thing, right? Right, right. It's like they, they, feel like, you know, Latinos will be a big part of our churches or already are a big part of our right. churches. I think, I think uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct, sort of the evangelical wings of Christianity in the United States are very fast growing among Latino communities. It's well, very... you know, that's, an, that's a really interesting question because I think that, you know, I've looked at this a little bit because you have people like Sam Rodriguez of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, and he's been probably one of the people at the forefront of pushing this idea that um, 
uh, Latino evangelicals are a pivotal vote that both Republicans and Democrats should be going after. But they still are tiny in comparison to Latino Catholics and even right. smaller, I think, according to some polling, than unaffi religiously unaffiliated Latinos. So I think a little bit with Rodriguez is a little bit of self-promotion um, that you know, he claims to represent something like, his organization claims to represent something like 18,000 uh, Latino evan evangelical churches, which sounds like a lot um, and maybe some of them are tiny in terms of the number, the size of their congregations. Uh, but I've always felt a little bit like it was a bit of a, a bit of an exaggeration of numbers, even if there is an aspiration to evangelize more Latinos and bring them into this socially conservative fold. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, you want to be more liberal on immigration for obvious reasons. I mean, and those reasons might be political, but they're all, they also might be moral and, you know, humanitarian. Uh, but I think that for a white religious right leader like Richard Land, um, you know, he sees, he's looking at it as a political numbers thing, I think. Um, and so, but I think that they're still, they're, they're not a significant, they may be growing, but I don't think that they're a significant voting block outside of certain states. Oh, yeah, no, agreed. I don't, they're not, I mean, you're right that um, the number of Latino Catholics just dwarfs the number of Latino evangelicals, but I, I, and I might be wrong about this, but I think that in terms of, like, growth rates, and this makes sense, like, they're, uh -huh. if most Latinos are Catholic, then obviously, like, unless you all of a sudden have this huge explosion of non-affiliated Latinos, the growth rate for Catholic Latinos is going to be pretty steady. Um, Whereas the growth rate for Latino evangelicals will just be much higher, even if the numbers are small. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that it, it might take a generation or two to see what, see how that plays out yeah. um, in terms of the demographics. But I think that there's a little bit of, um, there's a reality and then there's PR spin and then there's <laughs> aspiration. And I think like all of those things get conflated together when we start talking about uh, Latino evangelicals and their importance in um, in electoral politics. And I think that for Rodriguez, he's a sort of interesting figure because I remember I interviewed him in 2008, right around the time of the Republican National Convention. And he said something, I mean, I have the quote precisely, but I do remember he used the word xenophobic and nativist to describe <laughs> The, the convention, the yeah. Republican National Convention. And that was something that was of great concern to him. But then on the other hand, he uh, he's very opposed to same-sex marriage. He's very opposed to legal abortion. He uh, has aligned himself with the religious right on all issues that relate to same-sex marriage and abortion, you know, the opposition to the um, Affordable Care Act because of the imaginary abortion funding and uh, opposition to uh, the Planned Parenthood facility that was being built in Houston, which the religious right claimed was, you know, targeting a neighborhood that was largely Latino and African American, and so you know, it's sort of like, well, you know, for a while, Democrats, I think, were trying to court this this person and his constituency, and you had people like um, Jim Wallace talking about how Rodriguez represented the Browning of the evangelical movement. But then you look at his strong, uncompromising position on those issues, and you think, well, you know, he's never going to vote for a Democrat. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, it, you know, I think that a few years ago, I think there was more optimism that that there would be this, quote unquote, browning of the evangelical movement to bring in a kind of less uh, doctrinaire evangelical who might be some sort of swing voter for Democrats. But I think that so far that hasn't played out. It's because of the social issues, but the, the, I hate calling them that, but right. the sex issues. So I don't know. I mean, do you have a different? No, I, I, think, that? I think, I think that's about right. Um, I, I also think that it sort of illustrates what I think what, what might happen with Latinos, right? That, once you know, once you're 
once you're mainstream. So like Catholics are like mainstream voters. Um, and once that happens, once you're sort of in cons there, uh, how you vote depends more on things other than your group identity. It depends on your income, your education, where you live, um, stuff like that. Um, so that's why the Catholic vote, right, is like indistinguishable from Everybody. the median voter because right. Catholics are mainstream, incredibly diverse. Um, and so, you know, if you take a survey of Catholics, you're likely going to get within a few points of a survey of everyone. Right, right. Uh, um, Which is, and, you know, so, so go ahead, finish that thought. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So I think it's, I think, well, the same thing will basically happen with Latinos that like, you know, at a certain point, their preferences being Latino will no longer be relevant to their electoral preferences. And so at least for most, I, I think you'll have like the, the, the children of undocumented immigrants um, or lower income Latinos that, that will still be, um, their identity will still play a part in their voting, but for a lot of others, it won't. Um, and so, you know, Latino evangelicals might in some ways be the future, um, for Latinos, just like a group of people, um, whose group identity matters less than say their religious affiliation um, and their church attendance. Right. But I mean, even though Catholic voters are basically just like the entire voting population in terms of the, the breakdown of their vote, still, you know, they're still discussed as being the ultimate swing vote. Right. There's been endless hashing over of how the Obama administration's contraception coverage requirement uh, is going to impact the Catholic vote. Right. Um, so, you know, you're saying that over time, these different voting or these different demographic categories will be less meaningful, yet, even though in reality, the uh, category of Catholic isn't meaningful in terms of the vote, the, the re religious affiliation, driving the vote in a certain way or distinguishing them from the population as a whole, still somehow pundits and political strategists are fixated on the Catholic vote. Right. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, they're, they're, you know, unfortunately pundits bear no real obligation to uh, <laughs> how things actually are. So I mean, it's totally possible that like, you know, future pundits will discuss Latino, like even if Latinos begin voting indistinguishably from the, uh, the median voter, um, pundits will still discuss the Latino vote as a thing. And I mean, in some ways it is like, I think I said this with regards to Catholics, but if like Barack Obama suddenly came out and it was like, you know, I think the Pope, the Pope is the whore of Babylon. Then like, obviously people's Catholicism would suddenly become a thing that, you know, affects their voting choices. Um, but in the, in the absence of something extreme, like, you know, anti-papism or like extreme, um, xenophobia, um, or anti-Latino racism, then it's likely that, you know, latino this will not be the activating thing. Um, it's funny, what's really funny about the Catholics as a swing voter thing is that what pundits are essentially saying is that voters are swing voters, that like, if you aggregate a large enough group of voters, that they're swing voters. Right. Um, like, you know, in which case the electorate is a swing voter. Yeah, um, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that the Catholic thing, the Catholic issue, so to speak, is not going away. I mean, I think it's going to hang over the election, hang over the campaign until election day. Yeah. Because, you know, the bishops have this fortnight for freedom, which I don't think, you know, I think that a lot of Catholics are opposed to it. Um, I think there are probably Catholics who are just indifferent to it. I think the people who are going to show up at the Fortnite for Freedom events that the Catholic Church is having across the country are people who were already um, agitated about the contraception issue. Right. It's not, I, I have a hard time seeing how it's going to bring out more people, but it could serve to harden the position of the people who are already against it. But electorally speaking, I'm not sure that it's really going to make any difference, although it seems apparent that it's that it seems like they, they do want to have some influence on the election, even but, though they won't come out and say it. 
for I, obvious reasons. I don't think it will. Like you said, the people most likely to be affected by that thing are also the people most likely to be voting for Republicans anyway. But like mm -hmm. the the you know there isn't very much overlap between um, undecided voters, I guess, and voters who are very passionate about contraception access. Right, I mean, because um, if you were already passionate about that, you wouldn't be undecided. Right, right. <laughs> um, I mean, with, with regard to the bishops, it seems it seems to me that like they're what they want is for Catholic Catholic to be an organizing sort of um, category for voters. That like if you are a, a belong to the Catholic Church, then that is the thing that drives your vote, and that things like the Fortnite of Freedom are an attempt to make Catholicism a salient characteristic again for voters. Um, but I think that, I mean, that's sort of overestimating, I think, the degree to which most people who are Catholic are particularly religious. Or even, th there are people who are religious but aren't, but don't care about this issue. Right, right. You know, their Catholicism is not defined by their, either their opposition to birth control generally or uh, their opposition to this this policy uh, but you know I have to say that the the activists against it are very very um, motivated and intense and they they have found allies in evangelicals who are more against it than Catholics are so it's a um, sort of interesting phenomenon which I mean that played out that itself is a really interesting transformation. Like, it's a very recent thing. Because in the 70s, I don't recall that evangelicals were particularly opposed to contraception. Um, no. Abortion was just becoming an organizing principle for... I mean, evangelicals were just re-entering politics in the, you know, in the 60s. Um, in the 70s was when abortion became a thing. And the contraception thing, I feel, is very recent. Well, I think there are a few things going on here. One is a growing movement of evangelicals who are against, against using birth control. So like people who follow the same set of principles as the, the Duggars, who the, the family on 19 Kids and Counting right. reality show who campaigned with Rick Santorum, you know, campaigned with the Catholic Rick Santorum. It was, you know, an interesting phenomenon to me to watch that, right? So these well-known, almost pop culture icon evangelicals campaigning with Santorum. But so I think that there's a growing movement among evangelicals. You know, if you read Catherine Joyce's book, Quiverful, it documents that. And the the very anti-birth control um segment of the evangelical world is still small, but at the same time, there are evangelicals who are okay with the use of birth control within a marriage, yeah. but not outside of that. So they see the um, contraception mandate, or they, they see just the idea that, you know, the idea of Planned Parenthood making family planning af uh, affordable and accessible to people who aren't married. Uh, they have an issue with that. Um, but they say that their issue with the contraception mandate is that it violates religious freedom because it's the government telling the church how it should act and how it should uh, deal with contraception. And I think it's been a very useful tool for them in their, in a longer term campaign that they've had to portray the government as being anti-religion and as trying to dictate to the church uh, how it should act. So I think there was this perfect storm almost, even if evangelicals themselves didn't care about this issue per se. But then again, and then you pile onto that, the false claims that some of the contraception, particularly the emergency contraception that's covered, is actually an abortifacient, which is what they claim about Ella and Plan B. And I even had an activist say to me a couple weeks ago that, well, you know, I think birth control pills, regular birth control pills can be an abortifacient too. So they've conflated all of that together. 
um, turning it almost into this alternative uni parallel universe of even being able to discuss the issue because right. we're not even talking about the same thing anymore if you're starting to talk about birth control pills as being an abortifacient possibly. Right. So, um, any other thoughts on these sorts of issues? Um, I mean, I was going to say that the like the the, the the idea that sort of this lumping all contraceptives into a single category of abortifacient, um, I don't think there's like this is sort of not related to my piece at all, but just as a thought, I don't think there's an, it is an accident that this is happening at the same time that um, evangelicalism is losing younger members, that like the number of people, the number of younger people who identify as evangelical, the number of younger people who associate positive feelings to Christianity is like shrinking um, at a pretty robust pace. Um, and that, you know, I think it's, it's part of me thinks that for like organized political evangelicalism, there might be this sort of subconscious realization that this is, you know, their last chance to turn the clock back a bit. Um, hence, this move towards like like a really extreme view of what um, of the acceptable boundaries of human sexuality. I, not extreme, but like and it's not really traditional either because it's like a very modern thing, but um, just like a hyper regressive mm -hmm. um, view of the boundaries. Well, in a way. I, I do think that there are several things going on at once. One is that there's an effort to make church more appealing to younger people, you know, by making it um, seem less austere. Right. But at the same time, there's this in the in the highly politicized um, evangelical world, this effort to, uh, like you said, turn the clock back on matters of sex and sexuality. But I think that that's also just a function of this growing alliance, which has been in play since the 70s, but really kind of gaining steam of late with documents like the Manhattan Declaration, which really brought evangelicals and Catholics together, signing the same document about religious liberty. So there's this movement to bring conservative evangelicals and conservative Catholics together so that you create a political movement where, you, you know, you take these two sh shrinking establishments <laughs> because they're so, so conservative, they're, they're losing adherence. Although I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that convinced that evangelicals are losing adherence, but um, I know that, I know that there's polling data that shows that, but in any case, so the, even the perception that they're losing adherence. And so they're joining forces to create like a sort of super conservative theological movement right. that dismisses old theological disputes that Catholics and evangelicals used to care about and don't anymore. Right. So, I mean, maybe that's like, maybe that's the, you know, that's really more the alliance as opposed to that's more the demographic, you know, super conservative, super theological, the, the super, the, super conservative, super theological conservative, as opposed to, you know, evangelicals or Catholics or whatever right. the, the old category used to be. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. Um, I think I think if you're to, I think if you're to lump them together using exit polls, it'd be something like people who attend church once a week. People who voted for Rick Santorum. <laughs> people who voted for Rick Santorum. Um, that's I interesting. Mean, I was going to ask, why, why don't you think that um, evangelicalism is, uh, or conservative evangelicalism, or what have you, is losing adherence? Maybe it's because I just spend so much time around conservative evangelicals, <laughs> but I do think that, um, you know, I think, yes, millennials are less religious than people who are older, uh, but there's always, but there's been sort of an episodic panic almost, you know, like, so you'll see um, evangelicals talking about worrying about losing younger adherents and we need to do more evangelizing. And, and so I think that, um, 
there's a lot of reinvention of evangelistic outreach so that there isn't this demographic loss of younger people. And so I think that, you know, you don't see the, the, the churches or the parachurch organizations or the ministries won't look the same as they did 20 years ago and 20 years from now, they won't right. look the same. And so you'll, you'll meet evangelicals who are incredibly theologically conservative yet do not really see themselves as part of the religious right. So their theological views are very conservative, but they wouldn't, they're not the kind of people who would go to the Values Voters Summit or Ralph Reed's Faith and Freedom Coalition Conference or get politically active at all. And yeah. they probably vote, but they're not, um, they're not uh, getting in the trenches. And, you know, they may not go to church. I mean, they may not have found a church that they like or feel comfortable at, and they might just do Bible study with friends or home church sort of thing. And so I think that all of these changes make it hard to measure what people's actual belief system is and what their politics are. Right. So um, that's, that's a, sort of a long, complicated way of saying why I'm not convinced of that. Yeah. So, well, this was a good conversation. Yeah, no, agreed. And, uh, well, maybe we can do it again sometime. Yes. All right, thanks. All right, thank you.